Welcome to a newly unearthed poem by Phyllis Wheatley Peters and the future of Wheatley Canon with Dr. Wendy Roberts. This event kicks off a year of Wheatley related programming at the library company to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the publication of Wheatley's poems book, oh, excuse me, Wheatley's book of poems on various subjects. In the spring, we will be hosting a conversation about Wheatley's life and legacy with two contemporary Black poets, Drea Brown and Alexis Pauline Gums, on Wednesday, April 5th at 6 p.m. That conversation will be moderated by Dr. Tara Byam, who is also leading a three-session seminar on Wheatley in a community-based context at 6 p.m. every other Wednesday in April. The links to register for both events are in the chat. Our visual cultural program will also be holding a lecture on the famous frontispiece image of Wheatley in October, in October, so stay tuned for more information. My name is Jasmine Smith, and I'm the Assistant Director for the Program in African American History at the Library Company of Philadelphia. I'm joined by Justina Barrett, the Director of Programs and Education at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, who will be moderating the Q&A following Dr. Roberts' presentation. We encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screens throughout the event. Now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Wendy Raphael Roberts is Associate Professor of English at the University at Albany, SUNY, and a 2022-2023 short-term fellow in the library company's program in African American history. She researches and teaches within the field of early American literature with the focus on poetry and evangelical culture. Her first book, Awakening Verse, The Poet Poetics of Early American Evangelism was recently awarded the Early American Literature 2022 Book Prize. She is working on her second monograph entitled Phyllis Wheatley Peters Poetic Worlds, which in addition to support from the Beinecke Library has just received the NEH Fellow for 2022 or 2023 to 2024. The talk she is giving tonight is taken from her forthcoming article in Early American Literature, 58.1, which will be out in early February. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Jasmine. Um, and Allison, thank you for agreeing to uh, do the PowerPoint. If you can bring that up now, that would be great. So while that's um, coming up, I would just like to say I'm thrilled to be able to participate with so many scholars, um, artists, students, and members of the public who will be celebrating this year during the 250th anniversary of Whitley's Book of Poems in London in 1773. And um, really one of, I would say, and I think many of us would say is the most, one of the most important books of poetry in English in the 18th century. Um, and we're all here because of her, which is powerful to me because she continues to be an effective actor in the world 250 years later. And of course, the study of Wheatley Peters has been furthered by a host of people who have made Wheatley Peters studies what it is today. And I certainly can't name them all right now. Uh, but in bibliographic work specifically, I want to honor some of the earliest, such as Dorothy B. Porter and William H. Robinson, and acknowledge the hard work of those that have protected, archived, and republished the works that we have now. Uh, that includes, and I thank you to LCP and HSP for not only preserving these materials, but also supporting the people who study them. If you could advance to the next slide, thank you. The poem I will talk about today on the death of Love Roach is uh, what I have come to conclude the earliest full length elegy that we have. I say full length because the earliest recorded poem that we have is a four line elegy written down by historian and MHS founder, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Belknap, and which he tagged Phyllis's first effort. 
Vincent Coretta has made this archival piece known in 2010. It is a complete poem, but it is not a mature elegy of the quality and length that we associate with the developed artists that Wheatley Peters became by the age of 14 or 15. The only full length poems we know of that were or could have been earlier than the Love Roach poem and were written the same year, 1767, are atheism and its variants and deism and its variants and her magnificent poem, which I love to teach to the University of Cambridge. Um, none of these are elegies. I suppose I'm saying all this uh, to justify some of the headlines because um, first make good the headlines, but it's not really the most important thing. Um, what is important is we now have another Wheatley Peters poem, I believe, in the first year in which scholars have a burst of documented poetic productivity and manuscript circulation. And this year, of course, ends with Wheatley Peters' first known printed poem on Hessian Coffin in December uh, 1767 in the Newport Mercury. So let me say a few things about how I came across this poem uh, before I get into how I come to my attribution. Um, since 2015, I've been researching in archives across New England, looking for more evidence of Wheatley Peters' involvement with and connection to poetic coteries uh, for a new book project on Wheatley Peters' manuscript circulation and networks. I've been primarily focused on commonplace books, or more specifically, a kind of commonplace book called a poetic miscellany. Um, which were books in manuscript that uh, people would write uh, poems in, uh, sometimes um, as a final copy, sometimes as a, as a shared project. For this project, I found poems written about Wheatley and written to Wheatley, as, very, as well as variants of Wheatley poems circulating in manuscript. And together, um, they're slowly building the case uh, for a networked intellectual who participated in manuscript publication and poetic coteries in many of the ways that we would come, we come, we would expect other writers of the time to do. Last January, I came to LCP and HSP to continue this work, knowing several of Wheatley Peters' poems were held here, including one version of atheism copied by the Quaker poet Hannah Griffiths. I was working on some variants of poems I'd located in uh, Quaker commonplace books elsewhere, and I wanted to cast my, light, my net large, so I pulled commonplace book after commonplace book from any Quaker family from about 1760 through 1790, if it indicated that ha had any poems in it. I didn't know what I would find when I pulled the Jones family papers which the fine, uh, finding aid said had a manuscript of books, uh, of poems tucked in it. Uh, so it looked like the usual commonplace books that I'd seen other Quaker girls keep with poems, moralisms, and noteworthy, uh, noteworthy Quaker texts. I immediately noticed its similarities to Catherine Haynes and Sarah Drinker's commonplace books uh, that are held at Haverford and HSP. Um, and people familiar with Joanna Brooks's work uh, will know those names and I'll talk about them in a little bit. Um, especially the kind of, of stylized uh, titles, flourishes, and the specific shared poems that they, they all included. Because of this, I didn't wait uh, to thumb through the whole thing. I just started taking pictures. Um, and then when I got to page 88, I put the camera down and I just sat. Um, can you move the slide forward? I, I literally couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, there was a poem attributed to, quote, a Negro girl about 15 years of age, end quote. And I was just stunned thinking, okay, is this another black poet or was this Wheatley Peters? Either would be monumental. And with much attention and research from that point, I've come to believe the poem is in fact Wheatley Peters. If the larger field of Wheatley Peters scholars find my evidence compelling, 
It will expand the number of Wheatley Peters poems known to survive in manuscript alone to 12. Remarkably, it is not one of the 26 non-extant poems listed in Wheatley Peters first and second book proposals. This means it is the only poem other than Phyllis's first effort that we had no idea it even existed before finding it. And as I began to study the poem and the book in which it was copied, I started to realize that this additional poem not only added to her known works, but could also change some assumptions about Wheatley Peters' life and work and contribute to methodologies for further study. I give a fuller account in the forthcoming article in EAL in early February, from which this talk draws substantially. But to, to be as succinct as I can uh, from the outset, I will just say this poem circulated in a network of Quaker women already known to have circulated Wheatley Peters' writings and within which Wheatley Peters scholars will not be surprised to learn of another. It not only enlarges Wheatley Peters' archive, but also what we know of her life, location, activities, public contributions, and influence on the larger cultural climate. I'll return to touch on these implications, and also to offer a sketch of the reasons I believe it to be hers, uh, but I first like to show a transcription of the poem and take the time to read it. Um, could you go to the next slide? <clears throat> a few lines written by a Negro girl about 15 years of age on the death of Love Roach, her mistress. What? gone and left us all in misery while thou art fled up to the regions high? Repine not, but adore the righteous hand that gives the stroke, recall the great command, weep not. I opened not my mouth, O Lord, because we are instructed by thy sacred laws. Patience waits entrance at the mourner's door. We hope she's happy, but the loss explore. Let not the loss, O oh friend, distress thy mind. All worldly sorrows, volatile as wind. Nor tremble thou, because each tedious night brings fresh afflictions to the Christian's sight. That love immerse that now inspires the pen and speaks those words thou must resume again. Ye know not, friends, you yet may meet with joy. At consummation, everyone reply. Thrice happy, thrice, Thou thyself shall view of grace and virtue every softening dew, there bliss and happiness forever reign, and uncontrolled sing a celestial strain. There peace and virtue never ending live, where love and friendship universal give. There vast profuse humanity doth flow. All these enjoyed is happiness below. It's hard to read the poem and not linger on at least a few key lines, so indulge me for a second. Anyone familiar with Catherine Clay Passard's work on Wheatley Peters, which shows how her uh, diasporic subjectivity comes through in her elegies as a kind of displaced grief, or the numerous scholars who have shown the complexity of her lines that speak in multiple registers at once, and particularly the political and biographical, will surely pause over the line. I open not my mouth, O Lord, because dash. That dash says so much. Through it, the poet is speaking by withholding speech, both in the meaning of the words themselves and also by speaking in another's words, that of the psalmist. The unsaid and cannot be said are made so palpable through that dash. 
And then you see that inspired pen and the friendship, the emphasis on happiness below and how it reverberates with what the scholar Tara Bynum has recently helped us all see about the whole person, Wheatley Peters and her pleasures. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to center what I believe to be Wheatley's Peter poem here in this talk and be able to close read it a little. But I'm sure many of you are asking, well, but first, how do we know this is a Wheatley Peters poem? And uh, I know this uh, because of some Twitter <laughs> activity. Uh, I am late to Twitter. Um, but I believe my favorite response on Twitter was something about not believing any of uh, the news because a chatbot probably wrote the poem. Um, and I'm sure that is not the case. Um, there are many reasons from internal evidence to suggest this is a Wheatley Peters poem, uh, which I go into the article, uh, that are compelling. But none of them are on their own decisive. In summary, I think we can say conservatively that nothing from the text of the poem itself rules it in. But more importantly, nothing from the text of the poem rules it out. The most recent issue of early American literature uh, was a special issue entitled Dear Sister, Phyllis Wheatley's Futures, edited by Drs. Tara Bynum, Bridget Felder, and Cassandra Smith, uh, and which also takes the occasion to honor the scholarly and poetic work of Professor Honoré Jeffers and her book, The Age of Phyllis. Um, all of this has marked a sea change in the field of Wheatley Peters studies. And one of the pieces in that special edition um, takes up the tentative attribution of nine anonymously published poems uh, that might be Wheatley Peters. Um, in that article by David Waldstriker, uh, he turns to Harold Love's categories for levels of certainty for attribution and argues uh, that the risk involved in misattributing the poems is uh, salutary. And it's, it's my sense that the field will be better for entertaining Wheatley Peters attributions at multiple levels, what Harold Love distinguishes as assured contribution, confident, tentative, and speculative attribution. So let me spend the remainder of my time detailing some of the reasons I attribute this poem uh, to Wheatley Peters at the high level of confident. Um, first, let me say there is a very real possibility that the poem could have been written by another Black poet, another girl 15 years of age. And part of my book in progress, I'm working to trace another Black woman poet who appears briefly in Quaker manuscript culture, but a bit later. And there would be a higher likelihood of this poem being another such poet if the surrounding context did not so firmly point to Wheatley Peters. At this point, another poet would be entirely speculative, placed against a host of evidence that lines up with Wheatley Peters's known context. Second, there is the possibility that the copyist was mistaken, and maybe some scholars will question its transmission and so place the poem as tentative or speculative attribution. And I can respect that. Uh, but I think a measured approach to the overall evidence points to Wheatley Peters, especially when women's manuscript culture is given its due weight in the discussion. So among scholars who focus on authorial attribution, the most conservative standard is that an author must claim the work in some way to be at the highest attribution category, assured. And this can come in many forms, from publication uh, with a byline uh, to a manuscript letter to a friend. In Wheatley Peters' case, um, 10 of her manuscript poems are considered assured attribution because their titles are found in her uh, printed book proposals. So this has been considered a way for the author to claim the poet as her own. 
Uh, at this time, there's no document through which Wheatley Peters directly claimed the Love Roach poem in this most conservative sense. From this standard, it cannot be assured attribution. I would just uh, like to add here that this level of attribution, especially if it's considered the only legitimate attribution, does a disservice to Black, Indigenous, and other writers of color and white women because often there are fewer documents printed or manuscript that are preserved. Um, in the 18th century, it can also be an issue because most writers publish both in print and in manuscript anonymously. I also think it prioritizes print authority and editors of print and the lone author in a way that does not sufficiently take account of other forms of publication that occurred in the 18th century, such as manuscript publication among groups of coteries who all knew each other and created literary communities. Scholars across many literary fields still regularly accept poems as an author's own at the level of confident attribution and fold them into the accepted canon that do not meet the standard of an author's claim to the writing. They do so when there is a compelling case made from both internal and external evidence. That is evidence from the poem, its language, its form, its style, etc., and contextual evidence outside the poem. So the way I came to attribute confidently this poem is the same way that one of Wheatley Peters biographers and editors of two separate Phyllis Wheatley Peters collected works, Vincent Coretta, confidently attributes the first known Wheatley Peters poem, Phyllis's first effort, which he does with no caveats, even though Wheatley Peters never claimed it as hers, and it appears only in another's hand, eight years after she wrote it. It's accepted by Coretta on the basis of Belknap's attribution, Belknap's embeddedness both within Wheatley's network and the local poetry scene, the subject of the elegy's proximity to Wheatley and internal evidence from the poem. And to my, no, uh, to my knowledge, no scholar has questioned it. On the death of Love Roach is another such instance of a previously unknown Wheatley's poem in manuscript attributed to her by a trustworthy manuscript witness embedded in Wheatley Peters network and poetry scene and about a person in close proximity to Wheatley Peters combined with internal evidence from the poem. So tonight, let me address just this extensive contextual evidence. Perhaps many of you, uh, like me, when you first saw this poem, um, immediately remember that Wheatley Peters published a book, Poems on Various Subjects, included the elegy to a gentleman on his voyage to Great Britain from the recovery of his health, because we know that is about Joseph Roach. This poem was written in 1772 after the death of Joseph Roach Jr. And what you may not have realized on first glance is that this is Love Roach's son. And from her few remaining letters, one she cared about very much and wanted home with her in Nantucket. Those of you in the audience who know Wheatley Peters' elegies know that the elegies that we have were written to important persons in the white communities in which Wheatley Peters made her public name as a poet. Composing a poem on Love Roach is in keeping with this history. The history of Dantucket and New Bedford um, cannot be told without the Roach family who were a powerful force in the whaling industry. Uh, both the Coffin family and the Mason family from which Love Macy Roach descended were founding families of Nantucket and crucial to its status as a whaling empire. In fact, marriage to Rosa Roach Sr significantly lifted his status and biographies of this family point to him marrying Love Roach as the move that helped him realize his business aspirations and dominate the area 
including an expansion in New, uh, in New Bedford by 1767. Astoundingly, we also have a second poem that Wheatley Peters wrote to people directly connected to Love Roach. And she wrote it not more than a month after the Love Roach elegy. To see this, you must know that Love Roach was the daughter of Deborah Coffin Macy, who descends directly from Tristan Coffin. Uh, Tristan Coffin is considered one of the primary founders of Nantucket, who secured land rights from Thomas Mayhew and became the first chief magistrate. Nathaniel Coffin descends from Tristan Coffin as well, and this Nathaniel Coffin is already known to Wheatley Peter, uh, Peter scholars as Captain Coffin from Wheatley Peter's first published poem on Hussey and Coffin. Hussey here, as Credit already pointed out, was one of the sons of the Quaker merchant in Nantucket, George Hussey. So both the newspaper and Wheatley Peter, Peter's title for the poem in her proposal describe the, the castaways as friends. That is not only people she knows, but also a term for Quakers. Taking up Quakers and Hussey and Coffin in 1767 was not an outlier for Wheatley Peters. In fact, all four of the extant poems from 1767 are connected to varying degrees to Quaker poetic manuscript culture. These early poems then reveal an intense investment and connection to Quaker poetic culture and very specifically the Roach family of Nantucket and later of New Bedford. Even without the copious assertion that Love, Ro uh, Love Roach was Phyllis Wheatley's quote unquote mistress, it is clear that Phyllis uh, Wheatley Peters knew the Roach family at the very least through Nathaniel Wheatley's business dealings. That was her enslaver's son. By 1765, Nathaniel was handling accounts for Love Roach's husband, Joseph Sr., and two of her sons, William and Joseph Jr. Joseph Sr. was one of the owners of the schooner, the London Packet, commanded by Robert Califf, which Nathaniel used for most of his trade. When Wheatley's soon-to-be-published book traveled to London under Captain Caliph's care in 1772, when Wheatley and Nathaniel sailed to London in 1773, and when her first edition of poems shipped from London to the colonies on the famous Dartmouth, they were all on vessels owned by the Roach family. I want to add here that though we have next to nothing from Love Roach and Wheatley Peters's poem is one of the few personal pieces of paper extant that testify to her life, we know that Quaker women on Nantucket did a good deal of the business dealings, especially while their husbands were away at sea. A year before Love Roach's death, we do have one letter that she wrote to her son, Joseph Jr., uh, a good part of which is unreadable, but mentions Captain Califf and the receipt of goods Joseph Jr. sent to her, which suggests that Love Roach, like other Nantucket Quaker women, handled business, which would include the close dealings with Nathaniel Wheatley. Love Roach's engagement with the family business is again evident in a second letter that we have that she wrote in 1762 while her husband was absent. In the letter, which was to the Philadelphia Quaker merchant minister and abolitionist John Pemberton, brother of James Pemberton, later president of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, she expresses her love and friendship to him, his family, and all their shared overseas friends through a parting gift of spermaceti, uh, the waxy well substance used for candles that the roaches harvested. It was a gift that represented their expanding economic power. So here in this letter, you can see her deftly handling business, political, and religious relationships. 
But could Wheatley have known Love Roach in a more direct and specific capacity? The copyist, as you saw, weighs in on this question. According to Potts, Love Roach was Wheatley Peters's quote unquote mistress. This information at first appears at odds with what we have known so far about Wheatley Peters' first years in Massachusetts. However, given the larger context of Wheatley Peters' writings I've just outlined, it should be evaluated seriously. To do this, I turn to the reliability of the manuscript witness, witnesses, both the individual copyists and the scribal network within which she was thoroughly embedded. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. It makes sense that Quaker women cherished, copied, and circulated Wheatley's Peters on the death of Love Roach, which shows up in the commonplace book 15 years after it was penned. The commonplace book in which it resides participated in the extensive scribal poetic culture, coteries, and salons of the Delaware Valley, which included well-known poets, Elizabeth Graham Ferguson, Deborah, Deborah Logan, Susanna Wright, Hannah Griffiths, Denise Boudinot Stockton, as well as uh, one of their primary copyists, Milka Martha Moore, best known for her manuscript commonplace book created during the American Revolution and then later her published compilation, Miscellanies Moral and Instructive. As many brilliant scholars have shown, these women engaged in a lively poetic manuscript culture that included sharing poems on loose sheets or several folded sheets together, uh, as well as creating large and small poetic miscellanies in bound copy books embarked upon by one or several copyists. The assumption that is hard to shake that manuscript was always in the service of print or always aspired to print is simply not the case in the 18th century as many scholars have shown. And in fact, most poetry in early British North America was in manuscript because the culture valued manuscript culture or manuscript poetry. So the commonplace book you've been looking at uh, was written primarily in one hand that of Mary Powell Potts Jones. She was born in uh, Plymouth Township, Pennsylvania to Quaker minister Joseph Potts and Sarah Powell, uh, both of whom were received in the Gwynedd monthly meeting in Montgomery, Pennsylvania when Mary was eight months old. At age 17, uh, Mary Powell Potts married Jonathan Jones, whose family established the first Quaker meeting in Miriam, uh, Pennsylvania. Jonathan Jones was a successful Philadelphia merchant along with his brother Owen Jones and they had two businesses with the Folk Brothers. The couple were members of the Exeter Monthly Meeting and the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. And tragically, um, Mary died in childbirth in Berks, Pennsylvania in 1787, a little nine months after her marriage. Uh, and she was buried in the Friends bur uh, burying ground there. Though Potts lived a short 18 years, important women in the Quaker poetic scribal network already associated with Wheatley Peters' early manuscript poetry knew her very well. To give just a few examples, Hannah Griffiths, who copied and circulated a version of Wheatley Peters' poem, Atheism, held on deposit at HSP, was Mary Potts' relative. Among Griffith's papers, as well as papers kept by Potts's sister, are copies of the elegy that Griffiths wrote in honor of Potts after she died in childbirth. The marriage witnesses for Mary Potts's wedding also reveal some important close connections to this Quaker poetic network, including the Haynes family, to which I will return, Margaret Hill Morris, who was the sister of Milka Martha Moore, the main scribe of this larger poetic coterie, and Quaker teachers, Rebecca Jones and Hannah Catherall. They all sign as witnesses of the marriage. Additionally, the contextual clues from the commonplace book, as well as this biographical information, situated in close proximity 
to the important Quaker teacher and minister Rebecca Jones and her teaching and life partner, Hannah Catherall, whom we already know, thanks to the work of Joanna Brooks, assigned early Wheatley Peters poems for their students to copy. It is very likely Potts received instruction from Jones and Catherall, even if informally, through their common social network. Many of the poems she copied into the almost filled 156 pages are common to the more Logan Griffiths Coterie and scribal networks, poems that often appear in commonplace books connected to Quaker women's education in this region. Karen Wolf has highlighted the similarities of the commonplace books produced in 1775 by students Catherine Haynes and Sarah Drinker, who both took classes at the school of Jones and Catherall. And the influence of Jones and Catherall can still be seen in Potts's book. Can we go to the next slide? So this is Haynes' book, uh, and it's the end of the poem Atheism. Uh, perhaps most importantly, as Joanna Brooks pointed out quite some time ago, Jones and Catherall assigned their students Wheatley Peters' poetry to copy in their commonplace books. We have known that at least one of their students, Catherine Haynes here, copied Wheatley Peters' poem Atheism, which was never published. When I went back to study this commonplace book, it was not the only Wheatley Peters poem that Haynes copied within it. It was just the only one that Haynes attributed to her. Can we go to the next slide? The other two poems in Haynes' commonplace book that we know uh, for are Wheatley Peters but are not attributed in this commonplace book to her are to Mrs. Ellis on her remarkable deliverance in the hurricane in North Carolina, which is the variant of the one published in poem 1773, and to the Honorable Commodore Hood on his pardoning a deserter, which exists only in manuscript and is a variant of the known manuscript at HSP. This is extremely important because it tells us, among other things, that Haynes copied from manuscript poems circulating within this Quaker community, even after Wheatley Peter's published book appeared. In other words, they had their own manuscripts or scribal publications to go by, and print did not usurp them as the final authoritative version. Additionally, the one poem of the three that Haynes copied that had been published nonetheless included specialized information known to this manuscript network, the subject's name. Here at the top, it says Mrs. Ellis, and in the table of contents, it says Mrs. Maria Ellis. Information, the printed version, excluded. In fact, until now, scholars did not know who this elegy was for. Now we know it was this Quaker woman known to this Quaker, uh, known to this poetic network. Can we go to the next slide? It is not at all surprising then that another young woman within the Quaker community connected to Jones, Catherall, and Griffiths would copy yet another Wheatley Peters poem that exists in manuscript alone. It is not surprising that Potts attributes the elegy on the death of Love Roach to quote, a Negro girl about 15 years of age, end quote which is the same biographical attribution used by other Quakers within this specific network who copied Wheatley's manuscript poems written in 1767 and different from the age given by those outside this Quaker network in 1767. Nor is it surprising that Rebecca Jones would have had the Love Roach elegy because she worked closely with the Roaches of Dantucket and later New Bedford, including missionary travel with William Roach in England and other leaders in Quaker abolitionist efforts. Rebecca Jones even stayed in touch via letter with the Roaches who later moved to Ohio. Quaker ministers like Rachel Wilson and Rebecca Jones often traveled between Nantucket, Rhode Island, and Pennsylvania that Wheatley's early poems show up in relation to the same geography makes complete sense. 
Potts reliably transmits other poems from this Quaker network. Specifically, she provides another attribution of a poem series entitled A Letter from a Clergyman and Lavinia's Answer, often circulated within networks connected to Rebecca Jones, both in America and in England, that scholars who work on these women's scribal networks have yet to be able to identify. The dates and names assigned to other poems in Potts's book are consistent with other commonplace books. It is simply not plausible that a well-respected member of this poetic network would intentionally deceive their close familial and social ties about Wheatley Peters' authorship, especially given that these social ties were so often created and sustained through scribal publication and manuscript circulation. Under the mentorship of the revered teacher and Quaker minister, Rebecca Jones, such an error would have been noticed and corrected. Though Wheatley Peters never claimed the Roach Elegy, the most conservative standard for assured attribution, a poetic manuscript network of witnesses that clearly, clearly knew and circulated Wheatley Peters' early work does attribute the poem to her. All of the contextual evidence lines up to support their claims. As we've seen, local networks often knew much more than appeared in print, even if print is often treated as the authority. Let me now return to Potts and by extension, the Quaker poetic coterie within which she was embedded and the claim to know details of her life that we do not, that Love Roach was Wheatley Peters's quote unquote mistress. It is certainly possible that Potts was simply mistaken when she wrote this. And if she was mistaken, it would not refute all of the extensive evidence for authorial attribution of the poem to Wheatley Peters. However, it would be a strange mistake since Wheatley Peters and slavers were well known both to the general public and to this particular scribal network as John and Susanna Wheatley of Boston. It is likely that Potts, so closely affiliated with the Nantucket shipping community, including the Roach family and the Philadelphian merchant and Quaker communities, knew more details about Wheatley Peters' first years in America than print publications cared to highlight. What incentive would there be for the Wheatley family while showing off their genius and slave poet to highlight times when she was hired out or taught by others. It would not be out of the question for Wheatley Peters and slavers to have hired her out to the Roach family for a time, especially to provide comfort and company or to serve as an amanuensis for an alien love Roach while her husbands and sons were making plans to move to New Bedford. The Wheatleys after all had business incentives for the Roaches to do well and to expand into New Bedford, even if Love Roach did not want to move there, which is the reason they did not move until after her death. This seems to be the most compelling explanation to me. Unfortunately, there is no known record yet that would conclusively confirm Wheatley Peters' exact relationship to Love Roach. In the few papers we have from Love Roach, she made it clear that she admired and encouraged those with abolitionist sympathies. Perhaps she gained Wheatley Peters' affection and trust as expressed in the elegy because of her sons, and by inference her own, respect for enslaved people. In 1767, James Dexter, an important figure in the Philadelphia Black community, bought his own freedom Love Roach would have admired that John Pemberton, to whom Dexter worked as a coachman, assisted Dexter to buy his future wife's freedom. In addition to the increasingly outspoken abolitionist ministers that she admired, Love Roach's own son, William, was known to pay his hired laborers who were enslaved directly to the person he hired and never to their enslavers as a matter of principle. Famously, 
William Roach helped Prince Boston, an enslaved man from Nantucket, sue for the wages he earned in 1769 and 70 aboard Roach's ship and gain his immediate freedom. The case settled in 1773 and resulted in Boston's manumission. Love Roach was well aware of her son's doings while she was alive and counseled him in his spiritual growth, which included efforts to aid enslaved people and Black leaders. Given the actions of Quaker abolitionists she admired and the commitment to paying enslaved laborers by her own son, it would make sense for Love Roach to take an interest in Wheatley Peters and to employ her for a time. It's fortunate that there's a paper trail for Prince Boston and James Dexter in relation to John Pemberton and William Roach, but this archival evidence is not the norm. For instance, in the city of Boston, it was most often a word of mouth arrangement when someone hired an enslaved person. This is what we would expect if Wheatley Peters was hired by the Roach family. And we would expect that others in her network, such as Rebecca Jones, might refer to it in passing, as Potts' commonplace book bears out. In fact, it would not be the first time a Quaker family hired Wheatley Peters. By word of mouth and a tradition handed down by the Verplanck family of New York, we're told that the Newland family of Boston did so as well. If this was the arrangement between Wheatley Peters and the Roaches, it would place Wheatley Peters within the ocean community of Southern Massachusetts and Newport, Rhode Island, much earlier than when the Wheatleys fled to Newport during the revolution. This would have many implications, including for understanding why Wheatley Peters' poem, Hussey and Coffin, appeared when and where it did in the Newport uh, Mercury in 1767. Though scholars, including myself, have often turned to the Congregationalist revivals occurring in Newport for the likely placement of the poem, it's equally likely to have been someone from the Nantucket Quaker abolitionist networks. Wheatley Peters might have become acquainted with Ober Tanner or reconnected to her and others in the Newport community as well as form connections to New Guinea's growing community of color in Nantucket. The time with Love Roach would also mean that this thriving Quaker poetic coterie would have an earlier and more direct influence on Wheatley Peters and her engagement with verse. And more importantly, underscore the influence Wheatley Peters would have had on their poetics and their changing relationship to abolition. Wheatley Peters would be more central to the later story of black and white 19th century abolitionists working in and visiting this region. It would also add to the complexity of her political work in the midst of revolutionary fervor, given that the Roaches were not only loyalists, but owned two of the ships boarded during the Boston Tea Party. And it may have something to do with why Wheatley and John Peters went to Salem, Massachusetts, the town where Joseph Roach Sr., Love Roach's husband, started out as a cordwainer. However, even if Wheatley Peters did not spend time in person on Nantucket with Love Roach, the poem and her early involvement with this family nonetheless points toward her investment in the enslaved and free communities of color there and the influence she had on abolitionists in this region. We know Wheatley Peters wrote many poems we do not have. Some we know about through her book proposals, including a whole second book. And some we infer must exist for a writer as accomplished as her. I think the future of the Wheatley Peters canon will register these various levels of certainty in the spirit of coming closer to understanding her breathtaking impact. Thank you very much for listening. 
Thank you, Dr. Roberts. That was an incredible, incredible analysis. It's deep, it's thick. We can't wait for the article to come out. Uh, again, thank you everybody for staying on. My name is Justina Barrett. I'm the Director of Education at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And this is just such a treat to, to be able to learn more about this discovery, this incredible discovery that you made. So thank you. Um, can you just repeat again where, when and where the article will be published? Sure. It's in early American literature. It's in the first volume of this year, and it's supposed to be out like around February 17th. Okay, great. That's very soon. We look forward to finding that. Um, so, and if we don't get to a lot of these questions today, again, you, you gave us a lot of detail, a lot of um, uh, uh, genealogies to trace and to follow and networks to to connect. So I know it'll be coming out in print. Um, we do have a great number of questions. Uh, I encourage our audience to continue to put them in the Q&A. Uh, we may not get to them all. So um, let's see what we can do all as, as we can. I know you answered some of these already. Can you just start off as you did in the beginning? Um, Tech a little bit more about a Quaker commonplace book. I don't think they're exclusive to Quakers, and I don't think they're exclusive to women. So um, could you just give us a little bit broader view of that? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, in some ways, saying like a commonplace book is kind of like saying, uh, you know, I don't know, a novel, right? Like there's all kinds of different ones and you can splice them uh, differently. So when, I, when I'm talking about this particular network, I'm thinking about, um, and this particular Potts Commonplace book, this is, um, this is a kind of book that was used in Quaker girls' education. Um, it's not the kind where you would, you know, write your, you know, your letters, right? Okay. It, in this particular group, especially uh, under Jones and Catherall, it was, um, you know, in some ways practicing how to put together a poetic miscellany. Um, th they would include uh, prose as well, some like important letters uh, from Quakers. So there, you know, there were kind of be standard um, uh, letters and, and people in the Quaker culture that they would, um, make sure we're in there. Uh, but they were all poems that were being passed around mm -hmm. um, by these women um, in, a, in a way to uh, kind of I don't, uh, bring the girls up into this, into this culture and into this community of, okay. of poets. Very ex explicitly educational. Like yes. they are being taught to do this work, to understand these kinds of works, to um, share them to create okay. them themselves. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, did we answer this? Why would the the writer not have stated that it was uh, uh, Wheatley Peters' work? Why would why was she just referred to as a Negro girl? I think you might have said that, but could you? Yeah. I mean, so I touched on it a little bit, but I mean, it's that's actually really a profound and, and expansive question. So I'm only going to answer it in the very little bit that I think the person is asking. Right, because there's a lot of different ways to talk about it, and and people uh, much uh, smarter than me have, have 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 talked at length about the different ways that um, that uh, Wheatley Peters had to negotiate um, um, always being racially marked, and how mm -hmm. to like strategically use that at different times, and mm -hmm. how. Um, being anonymous could also, uh, you know, be strategic, but, mm -hmm. but if, if that was even possible, right? So, so why would, would the person, you know, put that at the top? Um, you know, the, the answer that, that has to be said, right, is that it's, it was, she was racialized her entire um, career, right? And so um, for, for this network, for these, for these women, for these abolitionists, right? She, she would be held up as, you know, here's an example of a black person's intellect, right? Okay. Or, or being able to, to do these things. Um, I'm trying to dive into how this particular group, um, you know, was, was, was dealing and, and thinking about these, um, particular issues, right? Because we've assumed that they were, when they um, were 
sending around her manuscripts that, that she was always marked in this way, um, right? It's Africania, which is kind of a nicer, uh, you know, co uh, coterie name, um, right? And, and she would call herself the, the Ethiop, right? It's another kind of, you know, pseudonym or, or position uh, role playing that, that, that one could do, right? Um, but it's also very interesting to me that in this commonplace book of Haynes, going back to it, and I found a few others, there are poems that show up where she is not marked. Hmm. And mm -hmm. that has been something that we haven't fully taken mm -hmm. account of, right? Mm -hmm. That what does it mean that she also circulates in manuscript, not just in print, as the Wall Strikers recently argued, um, anonymously as well. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's to be TBD, but definitely. <laughs> It's a lot of work. Um, this one is going to be more about the structure of, of the poem. Uh, so Kim asks, we see Wheatley Peter's formal preference for iambic couplets. Uh, she was going back to, she's looking at the fourth line where she adds, weep not, which breaks up both the meter and the rhyme. Surely the poet wanted to give extra emphasis to that thought. Could you talk more about that line? Absolutely. Thanks for pointing that out. I mean, um, to me, your that question is is talking about the internal evidence of the poem that I think is compelling, um, though not conclusive on its own, right? And the reason I say that is because in later Wheatley Peters uh, elegies, um, especially to those to to those two white women, um, she was very adamant of saying no, huh. stop weeping. Uh, <laughs> hold the emotion right? oh. so, so so yeah so you're pointing out even breaking the meter there and the rhyme right when I was reading it I'm looking at the righteous hand recall the great command and then there's this poignant weep not right um so that that to me is 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 is, is a uh a Wheatley Peters uh mark trademark mm -hmm. A uh, way of of writing these elegies. Um, I'll also just, you know, since mm. we're talking about it, point out that um, um, I think it's I would have to 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 look in my notes, but I think it's the all three of the the early poems. They all begin with a question, and this one does as well. Right. What, right? Um, and uh, they all start, you know, in in the heavens, and then there's always going to be a uh, a moment where she. Uh, claims her inspiration, right? Um, yeah, and it kind of follows that that form. Neat. Wow. Thank you. Uh, blah, 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 blah. A little question here. We might have to pull back. Charles, pull back some of the slides. Charles asks, "What does it say in what is written sideways in the left margin on page eighty-eight? Oh, yeah. Um, we'd have to pull that back. It's one of the lines in the poem. Okay. Right. right. Yeah. But I mean, so, but that's an important point. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm leaving out a lot and there's so yep. much, I'm so happy to get this out when the article comes out because there's so many smart people who work on Wheatley Peters and I want them to just go to town on this. Right. And, right. and uh, whether they agree with me or not. Right. But I mean, so one of the things that being in that corner like that, right. Is it, it just reminds you, okay, she's copying from right. something. Right. And she went back and she checked with and, care, and added right? something and that then she had add, and then added that mm -hmm. line right mm -hmm. checking it presumably against the manuscript that she had from her right. teacher right so she didn't go back and change her mistress right, right. She, so and it's it, to me it's another marker of like look this um sometimes um women's manuscript culture can kind of get just missed of like oh they're just you know, right. they're not serious. They're just kind right. of, you know, scribbling things down, you know. Right. Um, right. But the, this the, is serious the, educational this work. This is serious ed yes. educational work. It's social. Yep. Uh, uh, it's it's relational. There's all right. sorts of Im important reasons why you would take it seriously. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, knowing that others that they're sharing them and that could be shared 
there's a, a an authority that they have when they do it you know there's a seriousness with which they're doing it yes absolutely yeah okay thank you for an interesting talk so the, this uh person asks i was equally excited to learn of the poem the black rose which wheatley peters also may have written about a black woman what evidence led you to focus on another speculative intimacy with a prominent white family of which we have several rather than exploring a possible uh, emphatic connection with a fellow person of color, the evidence of which we have far less in in yeah. Wheatley scholarship? A fair and appropriate question. Um, and I struggled where to start in, in this talk, um, especially um, trying to suss out um, how this material is going to land, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because you have um, different ways of approaching attribution, right? And originally, uh, when I first put together the article, um, I thought, um, and I had initially received some some feedback that was like, mm -mm, no way. Uh, and I went back to the drawing board. And I thought, no, I think this is a Wheatley poem. I'm gonna <laughs> roll up my sleeves and you know, uh, and 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 go to work on this. Um, and at first, I thought I have to prove to uh, the larger uh, early American literature community, right, that this is a source we can trust, and. Um, once I do that, it's more likely that the larger scholarly community is going to follow me there to the speculative attribution, which, if it is true, is would be the most important poem, right? That 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 Wheatley Peters Peters wrote because. Many scholars have talked about this, right? There's so much that we have to read, read past. And I'm trying to to kind of use this archive of white women to like establish enough that I can read, read past. Right. Um, so the speculative attribution, um, I truly believe is speculative. Like I could sit in a room uh, with scholars and I do not know if it is hers. And I had to ask myself, okay, if you don't know it's hers, you know, what are you doing putting it in this article? And I could not not put it in the article and give my best reasons for the case for it. Because it would be shutting, it would be shutting this commonplace book and shutting this possibility, right? But there's, um, it, it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of debate and more than we could do in a webinar. I would want to do it with, <laughs> with people. <laughs> you know, yep. Let's really, Round let's tables. really get into this yep. because this is, this is a poem. So, so one of the connections and the contextual evidence that I think is, um, that, that I kind of build on from what I've shown you already um, to then move to this poem, The Black Rose, which is not attributed in this uh, commonplace book, right? But I've already shown you, we have a commonplace book where we have a Wheatley Peters poem uh, attributed in this way to a 15 year old Negro girl, and then another poem or two not attributed. So it would match that form. Um, the poem, um it's 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 a good poem and it's a tough poem part of the um the experience of reading the poem for me is that um if it's a, a Wheatley Peters poem um which I think it might be it is um it is one of those poems where you have to um, you have to work with it like you do on being brought from Africa to America. It is in some ways paraphrasing white racists and it is 
doing things with them. Okay. And, and there's some places when you read it and, or when I read it and I go, Ooh, that just sounds like, yeah, uh, that, that just sounds like a white person talking. And then there's moments in the poem where I go, Ooh, wait, that's, that's, that's Wheatley Peters doing the opposite thing yeah. where, uh, that's in quotes and she's going to, uh, deconstruct it all. Um, and so, um, I'm excited when, when, when it gets out there and, and, and uh, people see it. I think um, I've tried to do enough work on it to try to convince uh, at least a segment uh, of people to, you know, and, and maybe, um, and, and start hopefully a conversation about it. Yeah. I, I, I'm happy to say more. I don't know how much more I can say without, uh, you know, I could read the poem, but I don't really know how helpful that is because it just goes into the air. But uh, if that's what people want, I'm happy. I'm happy to do that. I'm just kind of giving my reasons for holding back on the Black Rose because I, I, uh, I do want to, I feel like to get to the Black Rose and for people to take it seriously, they have to decide, all right, where do you stand on this uh, Potts Commonplace book? Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and mm -hmm. and uh, there's different, mm -hmm. different levels of that the, uh, feedback. Okay, thanks. I, I, I mean, I think we have some more questions, but there are also some challenging ones. So <laughs> we're going to keep going. Thank you for that time sharing that process and I know I know this is this is this is the work of what you're doing and what the community will um hopefully walk with you in and 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 give feedback um okay so Rena asks though I'm extremely excited about this powerful finding and grateful for your research and passion uh for Wheatley Peters I'm curious about a couple of things how do you determine the integrity of the copyists and both rule out intentional misrepresentation of author for bragging rights or to lend clout to her commonplace book. That's one. How do you rule that out? Uh, and what is even common today, misidentifying one Black person for another just by sheer proximity? Rena says, we Black women experience these phenomena today as, oh, you must know so-and-so, any Black woman they have heard of who lives in some city where Black women live. Um, and I acknowledge that you're speaking to some of this as I type still interested in specifics. So how do you rule yeah. out intentional misrepresentation of an author for bragging rights or to lend cloud to her commonplace book um, and just misidentifying one Black person for another? Yeah. So let me start with the proximity question because I think it's so important. Um, for proximity, I I turn to the internal evidence from the poem. I think there are so many points in the poem that it resembles the kind of writing and moves that Wheatley Peters' other poems make at that specific time um, that I don't think it's um, a a proximity mistake. Um, oh, I think, sure. mm -hmm. yeah, I think the bragging rights issues uh, is fair, right? And has to be taken seriously. From my perspective, I would think that the bragging rights um, would be to be able and, and why it would show up in that commonplace book would to be to be able to claim Wheatley Peters in the um, the line of Quaker women's um, education, right? Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't negate that that might actually be the case. Just that. Um, this commonplace book wanted to make sure to underscore that, that yeah, sure, the Wheatleys, mm -hmm. but hey, Wheatley Peters was, you know, first with women uh, that are doing the same thing we've been doing, we do, right? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's complicated and, 
you know, one of the, the kind of things that is difficult in working with these commonplace books, right? Uh, because I use the term, you know, trustworthy manuscript witness, but I'm using that because I'm thinking about um, uh, Jeremy Belknap, a historian, right? Who's so trustworthy, right? Because he's a male historian. Yep, right. <laughs> right. Yep. Um, who right. gets to do history, who writes history, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right. But it's not to underscore because you can trust everything these, you know, everything the, these women um, uh, experience and perceive, right? Right. Yeah, but really good questions. Really good questions. Yeah. Again, that's why we host these webinars. This is why we are starting the conversation. This is why we host fellowships and you're going to publish and then people will yeah, absolutely. be able to be able to talk more. Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, did, did Wheatley Peters, Alan asks, did Wheatley Peters have children uh, regarding Black women modern diaspora? Uh, moreover, did she lose any children? I'm not, did she have children? Yeah. Um, I, I believe the latest biographies are moving more in the direction of, yes, she had children and they all uh, died. Okay. Uh, there was there were questions about whether that uh, was actually true. Um, but I think it's more recently come to land on, yes, but they okay. died. So okay. either way, yeah. there, there's not a line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is because I like this question. Rodney asks, great discovery, argument for attribution, contextualization. Can you talk about how this might change your teaching, either about um, uh, Wheatley Peters or the broader field of 18th century manuscript culture? Yeah. So how's it going to change your teaching? Right. I mean, so so one thing that I was thinking about was, um, uh, you know, I went I went to Nantucket to to kind of look in the archives there as I was I was reading this, and of course, you know, whoa, talk about a place uh, of intense wealth. Um, and I uh, went and, and visited some of the the spots uh, in. in New Guinea, which was a community of uh, color that uh, was really thriving in one of the first areas for black home ownership. And, um, and, you know, I think that resonates with um, uh, recent um, new information that um, was out last year about uh, Wheatley and her husband, um, you know, and um, their life together um and 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 kind of thinking about okay um if we're if we're placing Wheatley outside of of Boston and we're we're placing her in places that um even if not in person in in imagination and through relationship right mm -hmm. to um Nantucket um she's she's you know um she's part of kind of hot spots that are a little bit more radical, a little bit more um, um, th than, than if she's in Boston, right? And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think, so that in, in, in that sense, it, it changes um, kind of the, the earlier and then longer degree for me um, of, of how I think about her um, influence. Okay. Okay. And just giving it wider, mm -hmm. giving it wider, uh, play. Uh, this is somewhat connected and I think you've spoke to this, spoken to this a bit. Um, but the, the idea of it not being another author of color, um, thinking whether there are other African girls writing poetry, is it possible there were writers who did not have the same support and connection, um, that like a wealthy patron such as Susanna Wheatley this why again could this not be another uh black author yes so uh so it could be right and and I you know um I rule it out because I don't see any other evidence for it being her uh of being someone else um 
I think all I think all of the evidence points towards, oh, we didn't realize how involved the Roach family was Mm -hmm. with Wheatley Peters. And Mm -hmm. I think the more, uh, you know, I would welcome if it's someone else, because that would be awesome. Um, I think that um, even today, someone had seen the the little write-up about this, and a scholar sent me a journal that they had uh, edited on um, another Quaker and I uh, was like, you might be interested in this. And I was like, yeah, I would have been interested in this before it uh, went to print. But in it on, um, on, <laughs> on one of the uh, pages, this, this man was keeping in his journal. And he said, I went with Roach to go meet Miss Phyllis Wheatley when she returned from London. And I said, what? I had to do all this work. I, well, just, work. I mean, and there's someone writing about it in their diary right here that, mm-hmm. oh, one of the roaches mm-hmm. was taking this other Quaker to mm-hmm. go meet mm-hmm. Phyllis when she got off the awesome. boat oh, mm-hmm. and she had her manuscripts. And he says they showed us uh, the manuscripts and it was going to be printed more. And, and, and then it's not clear if she actually dines with them for a minute or not, but there's some other. And I'm like, what? Okay. So I think. The, I mean, the, for me, I, I think um, the question is important and it's and it's good, but I just I there's just so and the speculation is important as a methodology. But when it's speculation versus look, these are really tight relationships and this yep. is not a family that we knew before and and she's writing this elegy for this particular woman and all the stylistics and all the moves like look like this. Yep. It's really hard to say, Oh no, it was another poet. Yep. Right. But it's important that we don't dismiss, right. Just because you see, um, you know, it says, you know, a Negro girl that it's, that it's not another poet. Yep. So, so I hear that. Um, I just really think that all of the evidence points towards Waitley Peters. It's, I mean, this is what's exciting and I go, it's your, it's your work in your community as an educator. I can sit on the side and be like, this is great. Come on, kids. There's still history to be written. I mean, kids, literally the <laughs> high school kids I get to talk to, like we had students in the reading room yesterday and to be able to say things just got discovered, you know, it's encouraging to young people that they will be able to take up your work and, and take it forward. So I know it's very hard for you as a scholar who has to put something in print, Um, but the rest of us who try to get history out to the rest of the world, uh, we appreciate the effort and 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 the door that you're opening. Um, Did you say you will be talking about the Black Rose in the printed article? Yes, yes. So it's printed in full, and um, and I take up uh, the reasons that um, from the the poem itself that we might speculate that it could be uh, Wheatley Peters. Um, okay. And uh, the, the, as far as I know, and I'm curious to see, you know, what other scholars do with it, um, it shows up in print. Uh, I think it's 1805. So you can, okay. you can Google it right now okay. if you want to see the text. It's called The Black Rose. And it, uh, it's in 1805. Um, I'm sp- spacing on which uh, journal it comes up in, but um, and it's it's an interesting so far. The transmission history that I've been tracing is interesting because it comes probably up through New York. It uh, shows up in another commonplace book connected uh, to the Roaches and uh, in 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 New York um, through a school there. Um, and then when it does show up in this printed version, um, it's um, along with another poem that is in the Potts commonplace oh. book. Uh, and uh, again, it's not, um, it, it, the, the manuscript gives more information about who the person is um, uh, in, uh, the the tagline is a Negro woman of the name lately deceased being remarkable for her innocent and sincerely pious life, Philadelphia, the ninth month, the third day, 1772. And one thing that's interesting to me about the poem and and um, it you know showing up in this Quaker book 
um, is because uh, Rebecca Jones, this teacher and minister in her um, memorials, uh, quote unquote, Black Rose shows up there as well. And she's described as a woman that, that uh, sits at the back of the Quaker house and that Rebecca Jones sits next to. Um, and so this would have been um, an important person to Rebecca Jones in some way, or at least someone that she knew, maybe not important, uh, but someone that she knew. Um, and that was some way in that memorial um, by including her there, it's kind of this weird moment where it's kind of testifying to her, her yeah. goodness, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So again, look for the article coming out, goes deeper. I think we've time for two more questions before we sort of wrap up. There's great, there's a lot more and there's a lot of love and congratulations in the Q&A. So Make sure everybody's reading that. Anike says, Anike says, thank you for this fascinating discussion of your work. It's kind of what you were just talking about. You note that Wheatley Peters' publication of a book of poems never superseded the manuscript circulation of the coterie. Was this because there was still a stigma attached to women's print publication in this period, as absolutely. there was in the earlier days of Quaker movement? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there was still a stigma. Um, but also in the 18th century, you know, it's so different from now. Um, you know, um, a, a lot of the poetry, even the men's poetry, it didn't didn't want to be in print. It okay. was it was a, a a way to kind of show your uh, how you could move in society and and you know and to to form um, connections to people. Um, and being in print would um, was, yeah. A kind of a public thing yep. that wasn't exclusive right yep. so yes. so um, yes so there's many reasons why uh, different people would value manuscripts and not and not print yeah okay yep great okay so the last questions there's two of them uh where is the poem located <laughs> and and tell us how you locate it again so um i just did a qu quick search uh, in our discover on common you know, commonplace book, and there's a gajillion of them, but nothing yeah. that's called out. So is it in the POTS collection? Where is it? No. So like I said, I was, you know, I was pulling- In my defense, I've been at HSP a year, so I've only yeah. gotten through a yeah. few of the 21 yeah. million yeah. manuscripts, yeah. but- Yeah. So if you want to pull it up, it's um, it's in the Jones family collection. Okay. It was Jones, and that, I, that's mm -hmm. a, uh, it, they're going to bring you, you know, boxes- uh, pull the box that says it has a commonplace book of poetry in it. Okay. And, and, and that's uh, where her, uh, her book of poems. You is. don't remember what, um, what, what manuscript collection that is, Joan's family. Okay. Well, I've got to have Sorry. it here in my notes so I can give it to you. Hold on. Just a this second. is why I'm an educator, not a librarian. <laughs> um, take me forever to find my own. My and own. then as you're, if you can do two things at once, just tell us how far into looking at um, manuscripts and commonplace books were you when this one came up? Like what, like where that moment that you sat and said, and the magic of the document, you know, <laughs> like the light. From, and it, ah! So how long had you been unsuccessfully or, I, you know, I, I don't want to discourage people, but it's been a long time. <laughs> It's been a long time. Uh, this is the know, work. Yeah, yeah. This is not like most. Yeah, this is not most days. Um, most days, it's you know, it's looking at oh, hey, I found a a poem that is also the poem in this other one, yep. and like tracing yep. the mundane tracing of these connections yep. and spreadsheets, spreadsheets. And, yep. Yeah. So or whatever um, your process is. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I've been I've been looking since 2015. I spent a year at MHS. I spent, you know, four months um, going to seven different archives. I've spent time, uh, yeah. I've been, I spent a lot of time <laughs> uh, with. Uh, I hope something to show for it, um, but yeah. And you found it, it was about this time last year. In yeah, January, room. January uh, of, of last year. And I uh, worked as hard as I could to kind of get it 
uh, out as quickly as possible mm -hmm. in a yeah. responsible manner. Um, but so it was before you came as a fellow, you were just here as a researcher, and then you got the fellowship in order to sort of come back you know, and dive like, more dive deeply. In. Yes, that's okay. right. That's right. Okay, great. Great. That's really great to hear. I think we can wrap it up, but I really, I mean, uh, I don't sit in the reading room day after day after day. I see you all and um, I love your discoveries, but I get to just then talk to other people about them. So thank you for that hard work. Thank you to our, our community of scholars uh, that are out there responding to Dr. Robert's work. Um, uh, we've put in the We've put in the chat the upcoming uh, Phyllis P uh, Wheatley Peters programs that Library Company will be hosting. So it's a grand year for this kind of research. Again, thank you, Dr. Roberts, for all your work. Thank any you final me. any final thoughts for our audience? Uh, no, just thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for your critical eye that you'll bring, and um, I look forward to the future of the Wheatley uh, Peters Canon. I really do. Thank you for all your work, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you.